Hello, my name is Dr. Sarah Irving Stonebreaker. I marvel every day at the birth of Jesus Christ in Israel some 2,000 years ago. The Bible details the amazing things about Jesus' birth. Mary and Joseph traveling to Bethlehem, angels appearing to shepherds, kings from the east bearing gifts. But today, I want us to dig deeper, to focus on the why question. Why was Jesus born and why is this good news for you and me? What do Christians believe about Christmas? We've asked three prominent people who know the Bible well, each to explain briefly one aspect of why Jesus was born and what it means for you and me. Let's get digging. Well, it's that time of year again when uh, all of the Christmas displays are out in shopping centres and you'll see Santa Claus and uh, reindeer. Uh, strangely, one animal that you won't see is a lamb. And yet, let me take a moment to explain to you why understanding about a particular lamb is at the heart of understanding Christmas. In John's Gospel, in an explanation about who Jesus is, John the Baptist, who's Jesus' cousin, points at Jesus and says these, what might seem strange words to you. He says this, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, in three minutes, let's answer three quick questions about that. What does that mean? What has that got to do with Christmas? And what has that got to do with you and me? Here's in terms of understanding Jesus and the Lamb of God and what's that all about. This is the best explanation you will ever hear. No one will top this. I'll tell you why. Because this is the way God explains it. God set up a ceremony in ancient Israel about 1,400 years or something before Jesus. And here's what was meant to happen. When an Israelite, one of God's Old Testament people, when they had done something wrong, when they'd broken one of God's laws, uh, they were guilty, they deserved to be punished, and uh, the laws were very serious. They're guilty. What were they meant to do? Well, they were to go out to their, their flocks and find a lamb, um, a little perfect one-year-old lamb. As it said, the Old Testament says, a lamb without blemish. And they were to bring this innocent little lamb with them. They're guilty. Lamb is innocent. They were to bring that to the temple where God had promised to meet with people in the Old Testament. And they were to put their hand on the head of the lamb and then the lamb was killed and its life took, taken and blood poured out. And what was that to teach them? That was to teach them that guilt mattered, that guilt meant death, but that somehow someone who is innocent could carry that guilt. Um, and if they did that and they did that with trust in God, they would be forgiven. Now, that happened again and again and again and why were they forgiven? Like for 1,400 years, those sacrifices happened. Why were they forgiven? They were forgiven not because the little lamb died, but because that ceremony pointed to the one sacrifice that really worked, that really mattered. And that is in the year 33, on that terrible Friday, which strangely we call Good Friday, Jesus, who is called the Lamb of God, chooses to give his life in our place. And God, who has, been, who has been wronged in the way that we've acted, in the way our guilt before God, God puts my guilt and your guilt on his lamb. And Jesus, the lamb of God, dies in our place. He takes our guilt so that we can be forgiven. In fact, you know, it's only the person, the one who is wronged, who is able to do the forgiving. So it's God himself in the person of his son paying the price of forgiveness. So back to those three questions again quickly. Um, what does this mean? It means that Jesus becomes one of us, becomes human, and in our place is our representative and pays the price of forgiveness. And because that price is paid, God raises him from the dead, he's able to give forgiveness and that same new life to those who trust him. What has it got to do with Christmas? Well, in Christmas, yes, God shows his compassion. Um, God shows us what he's like. But fundamentally, Christmas is about Jesus being born as a part of a rescue mission to pay the price of forgiveness and then rise again. Third question, what's it got to do with you and me? It means God offers us free forgiveness uh, to know him, to have the promise of eternal life because we're forgiven. All we need to do is trust him and Accept that forgiveness. 
Uh, I remember as a child at Christmas, my twin brother and I uh, would love to go down a couple of weeks before Christmas, I suppose, around the Christmas tree and just uh, check what the presents were. You'd feel the presents, you didn't know what was in them. And that was the exciting thing. And then on Christmas day, you'd race down the stairs and there'd be the big reveal as you took the uh, paper off and you found out what that funny shaped thing was or that heavy object that you had no idea what it was. Uh, but you wouldn't know unless it was revealed on Christmas day. In, in the Gospel of John, the account of Jesus, uh, we're looking at how is God revealed to us? How can we get to know God? And we read these important words. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have uh, seen him. We've seen uh, the glory that comes. It's God's glory revealed in Jesus. And it says it's full of grace and truth. Uh, the interesting thing in John's gospel, there's no actual Christmas story. Uh, there's no uh, nativity scene. There's no shepherds. There's no star and there's no angels. But there's that term, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. God reveals himself to us through Jesus. You wouldn't know what God is like unless God chose to reveal himself. You could speculate. And the nation of Israel to whom that message came already had a, an occasion where God had dwelt in their midst. The term in John's gospel literally means God pitched his tent among us. Now, the Old Testament story has God pitching a tent in the middle of his people and putting his glory in the middle of that tent. But you couldn't go in there. You couldn't really have God revealed to you too much. But in Jesus, we have God revealed to us. And we don't just have God revealed to us. We have his character and his nature revealed to us. It says that he's full of grace and truth. He's full of both. It's not like he's 50% grace and he's kind of okay at times and he's 50% truth and he'll say the right thing occasionally. He's full of grace and truth. The story is that God loves us and that he sends Jesus who's full of grace to give us hope about a new life in him. But Jesus is full of truth as well. He, he says to us that you don't know how to get to God until God is revealed through me. Uh, John then goes on to say a little later on that no one's seen God except here we have Jesus and Jesus is revealing God to us. If you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus. That's the point of what it's saying here. So the whole Christmas story where the big reveal happens at Christmas, it's kind of shown to us uh, through John's gospel. But the key issue in John's gospel too is that it has to be revealed all over the place in John's gospel. And it says here in, uh, in verse 14, where we see that God is revealed to us in Jesus, it says, God makes God known to us. Here's the thing in our world. We can't get to God in our own endeavors. If we try to speculate what God is like, we'll come up with the wrong thing. The Bible says that all the time about how the way we behave, that we would speculate towards God, but we always fall short. We're creatures and he's our creator. In order to be uh, to know God, God has to make himself known to us. He has to reveal himself to us. Now, I don't know what you think about Christmas presents, but can you imagine if you're living a life where you feel that there's no forgiveness and no love on offer, that someone who's full of grace is given to us at Christmas? That's an amazing thought. But more than that, someone who's full of truth. You're looking for a way to live and you're not sure what truth is. And in our culture today, uh, there's all sorts of truth and all sorts of ways to go. And it's very confusing. This tells us that in Jesus, we have grace and truth and God makes him no himself known to us through Jesus. That's what makes Christmas uh, such an amazing event. That's what makes you want to race down the stairs on, <laughs> on a Christmas morning or any morning and just tear open the package and say, I want to see Jesus more because God is revealed to me in Jesus. His grace and his truth and who he is is revealed. That's what makes the John gospel story so special and such a Christmassy story, even though it doesn't have angels and shepherds and King Herod and all those sorts of things. But in the center of it, it's the same truth that God comes to us in Jesus. The word becomes flesh and lives among us. It's a great story. And it's a great story of grace and truth in a world so desperately short of those two things. Even people who have little time for God have an idea of what he's supposed to be like. If God exists, they might say, he's supposed to be a God of love. 
or God loves everyone. And sure, they might mean this in a sentimental way, but even so, people who say that aren't far off the Bible's claim that God is love, that the essence of God's being is love itself, and that his actions show us what love looks like. Yet it's easy to lose sight of how strange it is that any of us would ever associate God with love. The gods of old and those of today's world religions, they're not typically known for their love. They're known for power, might, wisdom, and for being rather remote from human affairs. Sure, Buddhism preaches compassion for all things, but it assumes that ultimate reality is impersonal. In some pockets of the West, there's renewed interest in Stoicism. Well, Stoics would shrink back from the idea that any god would get involved with humans, so there's a remoteness there too. Same with the god of Islam. Allah is the source of all wisdom and right conduct, but he remains somewhat distant. In fact, Allah is so totally other that the idea of God becoming a person seems blasphemous. And this is why it's bizarre to suggest, as Christians do, that God cares. And you get an idea of how in one of the accounts of Jesus' life where he goes to see his friend Lazarus who's ill. By the time Jesus goes to see him, Lazarus, however, is dead and buried. The sisters that he's left behind are heart sore and reeling from grief. And when he sees them, Jesus is so soft and tender to one sister, and to the other, he speaks words of hope and comfort. So far, this scene is familiar in its tragedy. But then Jesus himself weeps. And if Jesus is God, as the Bible claims, those tears tell us something profound about God. The story describes Jesus as moved in his gut. It's like his whole being groans at the way death rips apart lives and relationships. Remember again the gods we know. They're distant. If Jesus is God, then this is a God like no other. What's even more extraordinary is that, according to the story, Jesus is weeping at the grave of Lazarus mere moments before he calls Lazarus out of it. And yes, bringing Lazarus back to life is the official miracle of that story. But maybe what's just as miraculous is that a God with such power over death can also be undone by it. If Jesus is God, then he's a God who empathises with us and who, as a result, you can trust with your pain because he wants to comfort us in it. He's not one to remain above the fray of human suffering. And you know what? It would be just like this kind of God to come close to us, even to be born as a baby in a backwater town, and for him to be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. Those three tiny words have monumental significance, because if God is with us, then he is for us and near us. We aren't thrown back on ourselves to muddle through life. Instead, we can rely on the God who not only binds himself to us, but who comes to bind up the brokenhearted, as the Old Testament prophet Isaiah says. This is the God at the heart of Christmas. The story of Jesus' birth is an important tradition for many, but knowing why Jesus was born is the real gift of Christmas. Jesus was born so that we could meet God and get to know him. Jesus was born to solve our biggest problem by stepping in for us. Jesus was born so that God could come close to dwell with us, to comfort us. This is good news. And if you'd like to know more, or if you have questions, please contact us at thirdspace.org.au and we'll get back to you or find a Christian friend who knows their Bible well. I'm sure they'd be happy to help too. Thank you for watching and Merry Christmas.